Welcome back. This is week eight, lecture two, The Great War. Now, this lecture follows very naturally upon the previous lecture, lecture on nationalism. As I kind of indicated um, at the end of last lecture, that nationalism provided the context for understanding uh, the outbreak of, of war on a world scale. Now, The Great War is the title of this lecture because that is is how it was known. Today we know it as World War I, but that only came about, that designation, um, after the uh, coming about of World War II. So the First World War, if we look at it as it was developing, was simply known as, as the Great War. And it was a war that really shook the understanding of European society thoroughly, not only in terms of what war was, but in terms of the severity of war. Now, war has always been nasty. But somehow the First World War was on a different level. And it was a shock. And we will see some of that as we go. And also on the scale of the World War. This is not simply European-wide. This is worldwide. And we'll see some of those contexts as we go through uh, this lecture today. Now, I am not an expert in World War I, nor in World War II, nor in the 19th century or early 20th century. That you already know. So this lecture is designed to offer perspective, um, to offer insight into what this event was about. In terms of the specifics and the details, let's see more of the military history of the war and how it came about and all those things. I'm simply referring you to your textbook, chapter 26 particularly, um, but chapters 23 through 24 to 25 too are, are part of this lecture in terms of the readings for this week. And I know there's a lot, and that's why there was no um, uh, assigned source readings for this week because we needed to get through a lot of the, the textbook material. So please focus on that. Use the list of terms to know um, for midterm two as a guide to help with that. And this lecture um, is designed to help with that. Um, in terms of getting through all the details and the complexities involved, because it became a very complex um, development. Now, even though I said I'm not a scholar of World War uh, One or World War Two, there's um, a personal connection because my grandfather, uh, my father's father, fought in World War One, and my father was in World War Two. I don't know much at all about uh, what my grandfather, uh, his participation in World War One. Uh, he was born in 1896, and so in 1914, when war uh, broke out, he was 18. Um, and of course, it took a couple of, uh, of years before the U U.S. got involved. I have pictures, some postcards. I know he was in Europe. I wish I knew a lot more. I know a little bit more about my dad's participation in World War II. Um, but even there, I wish I knew more. And I wish I had asked my dad more about his father's participation in World War I. Uh, my grandfather died when I was 10. Uh, and so I was not really old enough to be aware to say, you know, granddad, can you tell me about your experiences in World War I? Um, but there's a con personal connection there. You know? I think because of that, I've always been very fascinated by World War I. Um, going back to being uh, in elementary school, I remember in eighth grade giving a presentation in my history class on World War I, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a personal element there. And the only reason I mentioned that is because it's so easy today to think, oh, that's so far in the past. Um, and students... Um, Sometimes we don't really remember what it was all about. Um, and it's kind of funny because a colleague of mine, uh, University of Tennessee, told, uh, told us about you know, one of his students, and this is you know, in the early 2000s, um, that he was lecturing. I forgot, you know, he made a reference to World War II, and some uh, student raised their hand and said, Excuse me, Professor, um, you mentioned World War II. Does that mean there was a World War I? So the only reason I bring that up is that it has kind of receded. I mean, somehow World War II and Hitler and the Holocaust is still somewhat very much present in our consciousness. But World War I, we seem to kind of forget about. 
and yet it had a major impact on society, on the development of uh, understandings of being human, and in some ways is part of um, the beginnings of postmodernity. Now, postmodernity, modernity I'm not going to be talking about for a few weeks towards the end of the course, but we really see this transition period. I think I've talked about transitions from medieval Christendom to early modern Europe, and then from early modern to modern Europe, um, and then from what happens with post-modernity. And that's really when we're beginning to get at this transition period already in the late 19th century going on into the 20th century of a, a shifting paradigm whereby all of a sudden this modern paradigm of the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution is beginning to crack and show its problems. Now, I'll be talking again more a lot about that and how that all fits when we get to post-modernity. But I just want to kind of foreshadow that that's where this is going in some ways. So let's look at some of the precursors because nationalism, or that's which has been called nationalism, um, was certainly a necessary condition of World War One or the Great War, as it was again as it was called in the time. But it was not the only necessary condition or sufficient condition. And another sufficient condition, necessary condition, in terms of providing the context for the outbreak of the Great War was what has been called the New Imperialism. Now, the New Imperialism. In so many ways, um, Europeans have been imperialistic since the age of colonialism, the age of, the, of discovery and of selling colonies. We talked about mercantilism and in the 17th century how the absolute states um, tried to, particularly France and England, tried to um, regulate economic policy using the colonies to benefit the mother country. Um, with the Enlightenment and Adam Smith and this idea of free trade, that gave way to this feeling of we should not try to control the economic trade for our benefit, but simply allow trade for the market to do what it will, because if we have a positive trade balance, I don't know if you've heard that term, but that's still a term that we talk about, positive and negative trade balances, that will still benefit the country as such. And one of the aspects of this, too, is allowing the market to have a force itself and to have the value be determined simply by profit. Things I talked about previously. We'll see that in what was going on in this period of what's called the new imperialism. So it's not to say that you know the Europeans had not been imperialistic or that there wasn't an old imperialism because there certainly had been, but things start to change, especially in the um, later part of the 19th century after the uh, Franco-Prussian War, which ended in 1870 and was the context of uh, German unification, which I didn't really talk that much about before. But what's going on is Prussia and France are fighting partly over two territories controlled by the Ottoman Empire. And I'll be talking about the Ottoman Empire and its breakup next week in lectures. Um, and so it is the issue that after the Franco Prussian War, for the next 40 years, from 1870 till 1914, Europe was at peace. But that is a misnomer because Europe was at peace in terms of they weren't fighting amongst themselves, but there were what has been called small wars in the colonies in Africa and Asia. And just look to see how this all developed, because this is what really the new imperialism talks about. I have up here on this slide um, from colonialism and the world system to uh, imperialism. Um, we have colonialism and then we have uh, the world system emerging, uh, which is a theory uh, proposed by Emmanuel Wallerstein, whereby we have the core and the peripheries, core being the European Europe and then the peripheries being the colonies, whereby the core uses the peripheral territories for its own benefit. And we see this in the triangular trade, which includes the slave trade. Um, and on it goes in terms of this world system and the emergence of a world economic system that had not been there 100 years previously. What happens with the new imperialism is almost one, one of scale in some ways. Uh, and we have up there, I, uh, uh, 
territories uh, and it's an 1800 Europeans based on the old uh, imperialism so to speak occupied or controlled approximately 35 percent of the world's surface I mean not the oceans but we're talking about the, the land masses by 1878 Europe occupied or controlled 67 percent of the world's surfaces and by 1914 Europe occupied a control over 84 percent of the world's surfaces that's impressive and that was made possible by these quote unquote small wars from 1878 to, eight, uh, to 1914 from 1870 to 1914 the increasing ability to conquer subdue hold and control now one of the things i'm drawing on for, uh, for this lecture and especially here with the new imperialism and everything is, is a book uh, by daniel Hedrick called Tools of Empire. No, that's backwards. You can't see it. Um, but talking about the technology. And one of the things he does is, is, is point out that scholars have talked about, you know, what was the motivation for imperialism? Um, and there are various theories and arguments in terms of trying to explain why Europeans wanted to be conquerors of the world, so to speak. Um, and one of the things he says is that we have to, to distinguish between motivation and means because motivation doesn't account for it all in terms of explaining why this new imperialism in the last 30 years of the uh, 19th century was let's say so successful in subduing the continent and not just the continent but the, sorry I shouldn't have said the continent I mean, the, the world and we can't really understand the world war the great war without understanding this context and how Europeans are using military force in Asia and in China to subdue the populations and then the ability to do so because it took a while and as you know Hedrick points this out there is you can have a motivation and a desire but if you don't have the means to bring that about it's not going to come to anything and that was what he his book is about in terms of the technological innovations that occurred during the course of the second half of the um, 19th century that made all of this possible so we're going to be looking at some of those developments um but first i mean it's not that there were not um wars and conflicts within uh the colonies again particularly africa and asia before the 1870s and, and on into the early 19th uh, 20th century there were um and for european gain and here I, i'm just going to point to two conflicts that were uh, of significance not that others weren't there were um there were other wars even named war like the boer war that i don't talk about uh today um in terms of, of south africa and, and so but i want to talk, talk briefly about the opium wars and then the suez canal the opium wars were fought between Brit britain and china and we're basically two that are identified or two periods of war the first is 1830 to 1842 and then the second is from 1856 to 1860 and what was this all about this is about the east india company which had been chartered you know the first joint stock company and chartered by the government but was an independent it was not as such a government entity they're trading with china with india um, and they established their colonies and that is the source too of the british love and desire for tea tea is not produced in britain tea is not produced in europe it comes from the east there's indian tea there's chinese tea and some japanese tea and the demand for tea was growing predominantly at this time it was coming from china china was pretty much self-sufficient in, in many ways it, it traded but it didn't really need commodities from europe that much it was getting silver and trading for silver but that's almost just just monetary payment for tea and china was in the period too of maybe we don't really want to interact with these europeans and so on. so there was an issue of how do we meet the demand and what can we provide to china that will and not enable but that will lead them to want to trade with us so we can get more tea and the product that they hit upon was opium 
Opium was being produced in India. And so there was this new triangular trade, so to speak, uh, that emerged, namely British merchants would go to, you know, to India, get the opium, and then bring the opium to China to trade with China for tea, which they'd bring back home to Britain. If you see there, this map, here's the map, we have it there, um, based on the East India Company and British influence in the colonies of India, if we can control the opium production, we can then use that to trade with China and bring it all back. Now, opium, there was medicinal aspects to opium, but also then increasingly recreational use of opium. You may have heard about the opium dens and stuff. The Chinese government wanted to crack down on this, and the British, supporting uh, the East India Company, sent troops to fight the Chinese to allow this illicit trade, so to speak. We're dealing with drugs here. This is drugs. And we think about the drug war uh, as being a new thing that is with us today, and it certainly is, but this was going on already in the 19th century in terms of the opium wars. Um, so not on European or American soil, but uh, on Chinese soil, because the government realized that, you know, opium is not a positive for the people. We're trying to close it down, and the British are saying, no, we need it for trade. We want tea, we need tea. And so this free market trade, non-governmental control trade, allowed for the British to supply the Chinese with opium, which allowed them, the, um, then the opium traders, to supply the British traders with tea that we'd bring back, and on it went. So this is a sense of the military, both in India and in China, the British military, needing to make incursions in these territories to allow their trade to take place so the British could have their tea. You say, well, what a bunch of, you know, you know, it's all about profit. It's all about profit. Now, what did that mean? That meant that, again, the influence, control of an occupation of territories in the East. This is also when, because of these wars, the, the British gained control over Hong Kong, Taiwan, the Chinese, China had. So we, we see this really geopolitical development that we're still talking about today in terms of you know the one China policy or so. And do we allow that or do we not? Do we support Taiwan? Do we not support Taiwan? When Hong Kong became independent uh, just like in the 1990s, I think the British gave up control. But there's a sense of how do we manage these conflicts, which go back to the 19th century and the new imperialism, which is, you know, Okay, I studied new imperialism starting after 1870. This is before 1870, but it's getting to that point. Now, the other aspect of trade, and especially with um, technology that made it possible, because with the military, the British military supporting the East India Company in their trade, um, and to reassert themselves even further in Bombay and in Calcutta, as you see on, on the map there, and then also to establish more permanent um, settlements in China, or what had been China, which became you know, Hong Kong and so Macau, up there in Canton, we find the means were more or less there, but the new technology allowed it to be even more efficient and and and, and deadly, so to speak, and more threatening. And we really see that coming about um, in Africa. Um, and the issue in Africa was then the uh, Suez Canal, which was uh, the means also of trade to the east. So these are connected. Now, the Suez Canal was built between 1859 and 1869. If you look on the map here, we have it. Um, we can see why it's so important, because the Suez Canal, if you look at that map, it's, that, uh, it's in Egypt. It's right up there at the top of Africa. Um, allowed shipping to go through the Mediterranean, go then directly into the Red Sea, which then provided access to the Indian Ocean, which then provided access to the east, rather than having to go all the way around uh, Africa and the Cape of Good Hope to come back to, um, to India. So it made for much quicker trade, 
um, less dangerous trade. And what does that mean? More profits to fuel, again, the opium trade. That's what this is all about. But then in terms of Africa itself, Africa was problematic in that they could get to the coast. But if, if Europeans wanted to go more inland to establish more of their authority and control in the colonies, if the, the Belgians, who were also uh, very much involved, we're talking about the Belgian Congo um, in Africa, and we, we have all the European nations were trying to gain territories by means of imperialism, imperialism conquering. It was difficult with Africa because of the impenetrability. What made for that to be possible? And here we have the real, we can see the real effects of technological development. And one of those was the development of the steamboat. Now the steamboat, you say, well, that been around for a while, hadn't it? It's like, well, not really. The steam engine had been since the late 18th century, but then to develop boats run by steam, which could be turned into gunboats that could navigate rivers. That's a new development. And so all of a sudden, with the development of the steamboat, we have travel, and whereas Europeans and European forces could not really travel into the interior of Africa, now with the steamboat they could. So here we see the Industrial Revolution combined with uh, this attempt to subdue and conquer militarily other countries and nations and peoples. And the steamboat was a major aspect thereof. One of the problems, though, was when Europeans began to increasingly go into the interior of Africa, spending more time there, they started to die by flies because of new diseases, particularly malaria. And how do we deal with malaria? Um, and the statistics are pretty amazing in terms of the very high percentage of military contingents, um, settlers, attempted settlers, traders who would go to Africa instead, who would die by disease and malaria. And it's like, how do we do this? And a medicine was developed, quinone, um, that was somewhat effective. So with the, all of a sudden, the development medically of quinone, or quinine, um, to fight against malaria, that made that even more possible. So we have the steamboat, quinone fighting against uh, malaria, and then we have also uh, increased gun power, power, firepower, guns. The rifle is being developed. Now the rifle um, is a new, uh, different from the musket, which had been the standard firearm that was used in the European wars, for example, in the Napoleonic wars. The rifle was a development in terms of making the bullet spin so it could be shoot further and more accurate. But the problem was what had been used in firearms um, in the musket were round shot, um, kind of like a cannon, but on a very smaller scale. And the rifling are the grooves inside the gun barrel that would make the, uh, the bullet spin. Problem was that was not very good result with a circular bullet. So the, the long elongated bullet was developed that then could indeed be fought a sh shot in a rifle that would be have longer range by far and more accuracy by far than the musket or than the rifle with the round bullets. So we have all of a sudden, let's say, the new weapons technology that led to overwhelming force against bows and arrows. Because it's one thing, arrows are you know, limited in their range. And if you have the musket and need to get re relatively close to be accurate, to actually kill somebody, you're not that far away from arrows. But with the rifle, you can shoot a lot better from further off so the arrows can't get to you. So in terms of fighting in Africa and African tribes, the rifle was a major issue. Then too, you could put cannons on gunboats, sail up, up the rivers, and then shoot from cannons from there, which would had no way of doing so in terms of of range if you shot your cannons from uh, the coast. So these developments were essential to subduing and conquering and colonizing the interior of Africa, also for the basis of trade and wealth 
and on we go. This is even after the slave trade had been disbanded. So we're not talking about that. We're talking about other commodities in Africa, gold, silver especially, that would allow and help uh, in diamonds, gold diamonds, and would help finance the trade in tea and then opium and on we go. So it's all con uh, connected together. <coughs> and then we have development of communication and transportation and the steam engine the steam boat was a huge um, uh, uh, development in transportation not just for military purposes and going up uh, rivers in Africa and so um, but also in terms of the speed of transportation in terms of crossing the oceans uh, as such and that went along with communication and the speed of communication which makes for far more accurate and, and more immediate Directives, orders, and on we go. And I'm just going to read a passage from Tools of Empire um, because it, it makes the case, I think, very well and, and almost surprisingly, but just to keep in mind what this was about. Up to the 1830s, when an Englishman corresponded with someone in India, his letter carried around Africa on an East Indian moment, Mun, sailing ship, took five to eight months to reach its destination. Because of the monsoons in the Indian Ocean, he did not receive a response until two years after he had mailed his letter. By the 1850s, so just 20 years later, a message from London went by train across France by steamer to Alexandria in Egypt and from Alexandria to Cairo by camel to Suez, going through the canal, then the steamer to Bombay or Calcutta, where it arrived 30 to 45 days after leaving London. 30 to 35 days. The answer took an additional 30 to 45 days for a round-trip total of two to three months rather than two years. 20 years later, by the 1870s, If a letter still took a month to reach Bombay, a telegram got there in as little as five hours, and the answer could be back the same day. The development of the telegram and the telegraph was an 18th century communications revolution in that it sped up international communication greatly. So that rather than sending a letter and taking you know, a long time to get to Bombay from London, it could be in a matter of hours. Now we can say, okay, but that was never the case in Europe. No, but a letter sent from London to Paris would still take time traveling by cart, by horse, um, eventually by train, because that's the other aspect in terms of transportation, because by this time, by the later 1870s, on into the 1880s and 1890s, train rail travel was had been worldwide. So the speed of information, we talk about the information technology, the speed that, that, inf that information traveled was overwhelmingly reduced, uh, well, by a hugely significant percentage, which allows again, two for more communication, more, you know, discussions back and forth. What do we do? Where do we attack? Where do we not attack? Do we not? And this became a problem, too, for what was going to become the, the Great War, because we have an issue of telegrams and the interception of telegrams and communication. It's in some ways, the outbreak of the Great War, World War One, was also a factor in miscommunication. That's some of the problem and some of the issues which we'll see as we go through and as you read in your textbook some of the details. Now I have up here the white man's burden um, because when we look at then this new imperialism, both in terms of motivation and means, with the technological developments, we have then the means to do so. And then what still are the motivations? Is it purely economic? There's also the missionary. We're still talking about Christian Europeans with a missionary zeal to evangelize all these new peoples. That is a real motivation as well. 
and that ties in to a more general sense of this white man's burden. Now, it's the a, a title of a poem by Rudyard Kipling, um, author of Kim, author of The Jungle Book. Uh, he was very involved in India and the uh, colonies, and British colonies of India. And the white man's burden was the sense of not just Christianization, but also civilizing. That it is incumbent upon we Europeans, we white men, to civilize and to Christianize and to rule and govern the world. And what a burden it is because it's our responsibility to do so for the good of the people we're ruling over. That was the mentality. But what we have is good and we need to spread it and to enforce it for their own good. It's very parental, the parental burden. And there is a parental burden. I mean, as a parent, I certainly feel it in that, you know, I need to try to raise my kids so that they are going to be good contributing citizens to society. Um, that, that sent, and I know better because they're children. And when they become adults, if they don't behave the way I think they should, if they don't you know, believe what I think they should believe, I may disagree with them, I may feel bad about it, but it's no longer really my responsibility. My work has been done. I can only do so much, even if I get upset by it. That's fine. That's the generational distinctions and problems that have always been there too. But this white man's burden is a parentalism of Europeans, the European white men, white men, for the world as such, we're responsible. And that le led to this increasing attempt to subdue the world for whom we are now responsible to Christianize and to quote unquote civilize. That too is behind this new imperialism. And with this new imperialism then becomes to the attempt to gain power and influence by newly formed nation states who are trying to have their citizens identify their own individual identity with that of the nation, which I talked about last time. So we have nationalism and imperialism, economic need, combining with the white man's burden to have Europe rule the world, as I said up there by 1914, uh, controlling uh, or occupying 86% of the world's territories. This we need to see as the background to World War I, and in so many ways the background to problems we're still fighting with. As we will see when we get to World War II, we will have the, the beginnings of decolonization and the problems of that, the realization that, oh, this is not really working, we need to decolonize, but that is not easily done. And you know, for example, to the Philippines is an example, it's an American colony. Um, the you know Taiwan is another still there from the bridge. And so all these issues of influence, control, how do we deal with this? And we'll see too in the Middle East, there's the same problem there in terms of control and decolonization. Uh, and we'll get to that next week to a, a bit. How do we handle all of this? And so in some ways, this is the the foundation of the emergence of the world in which we find ourselves still in this period of transition when the modern paradigm is no longer working when war is in europe it's rational it's between armies you may have seen you know movies or, or depictions of you know the army meeting in the field army meeting in the field and we shoot it at each other um also in, in ranks and you know <laughs> with the generals sitting up on the hills overlooking it whole new approach to war came about total war against society, not against armies, not against king and king fighting, against nation and nation fighting. And if you're fighting a nation, you fight the whole nation. And it doesn't matter what the rules of war are. Yeah, that's a problem. Um, and this is going to be a reference in terms of the differences in war. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen the movie Patton uh, with George C. Scott uh, playing uh, General George Patton, one of the major generals in World War II. So this is a World War II issue, which I'll be getting back to, but in some ways it um, reflects 
the new reality of world war, or war on the global scale, or war within the context of globalization, which we can call, talk about this new imperialism as part of globalization in some ways, which too is still with us. And Patton, General Patton, is addressed, and this is how the movie starts. That's is I think one of the best war movies ever made. Uh, and you know, it is fictional in the sense of its representing, but it is extremely historical and extremely well done and you know, like captures um the figure of George Patton, who actually my father, who was in the third army, and General Patton was the general of the third army. Um my father, don't worry, my father was a you know, private, so he didn't really know Patton, but he was there anyway. But Patton you know, in this speech, addressing new recruits, said, you know, I know you're afraid. I know you're scared. You're not, not sure what to do, but don't worry. The first time you put your hand in a bunch of goo that seconds before was your best friend's face, you will know what to do. He says, there is no glory and honor to die for your country. The whole point of war is to make the other poor sons of bitches die for their country. That's the point. If we can kill more of them than they do of us, we will win. Rules of engagement, rules of war. I mean, in some ways, that's always been the case. If you kill more of the enemy, then you win. Than they do of you, you win. But this was opening things up. This was by whatever means necessary. And that's what, why the Great War was so shocking. Because in some ways, we can say it's the first war, number one, not only on a global scale, but whereby the traditional rules of war no longer applied. Now, when we have all of this combining with... Um, an increasing lack of confidence in some of the very intellectual structures that form the foundation of the modern paradigm. We have, two a precondition for war. Because if you are like even really wondering, what are we doing? Whom are we talking about? And are we really dealing with human beings that are equal or are we dealing with some you know lesser form of animal this is going back to the slave issue but it applies to war as well i have up here the age of anxiety which in the later 19th century was now the age of anxiety anxiety usually refers to the uh interwar periods the periods after world war one um on into world war ii and this also was called the gilded age i'll be talking more about that but i think your textbook refers to the age of anxiety as the post-world war one period i'm referring to it here because really from the mid-19th century on intellectual developments technological developments economic developments political developments were emerging that shook the foundation of, let's say, the modern Enlightenment paradigm of the independent, rational human being. Maybe humans weren't so rational, weren't so special, weren't children of God, but simply animals. And even with the deists, or even with the increasing um popularity of self-proclaimed atheists still this idea of human beings are special was retained until we start undermining that <sighs> several issues and their dark and these are all, all come back to because in some ways this is beginning to set again like world war one and the pre-developments of world war one the beginnings of postmodernity and this you know crumbling of the modern paradigm and up here i have darwin and darwinism which uh, charles darwin published his on the origins of species in 1859 uh, in which he argued that humans had evolved from earlier forms basically but his whole point was not without uh, that's all of biological life that there was a process of natural selection um whereby adaptability was the rule so if you didn't adapt if a species didn't adapt to new 
environmental conditions that would become extinct and what the mutations were that enabled individual populations to survive um, would, would then come to the fore. Now, this is not the survival of the fittest because it's not necessarily saying that. It's, it's the survival of those who are most adaptable and perhaps even the mutants because a mutation would have to occur that allowed a new aspect, uh, a new survival uh, uh, me means within facing new conditions. Now, also Darwinism, and Darwinism is all isms is somewhat loosely uh, related to Darwin, especially in the forms of what was called social Darwinism, which changes things. Now, we talk about Darwin, then we talk about some of the implications, and some of the implications was, again, number one, the, you may have heard that humans are just monkeys. That was in a Scopes monkey trial that came about um, as, as a result. And that is completely a misunderstanding uh, at the time of, of, of Darwin. Darwin's point was not that human beings came from monkeys. Not at all. I mean, monkeys, technically, are not hominids. They, you know, the apes uh, <laughs> were, were separate from monkeys. Apes are not monkeys. But we were descended from earlier forms of hominid development so that hominids were one branch you know gorillas another orangutan is another chimpanzee is another of the great apes and the hominids are another now there's common ancestors somewhere way 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 back way back but on we go now this threatened our self-understanding i don't come from monkeys that's not what even the argument was but it was an attempt to say, wait a minute, who are, what are human beings? Where do we come from? If we are not special creatures of God, if we are evolutionary products, how do we relate that? So theologically, it's a problem for people who were still theologically inclined, as most people were still at the time. The, the, the number of atheists and deists were not very many, comparatively. So how can we handle that? And then social Darwinism was a thing of, okay, that is where the survival of the fittest came, in, came about. I mean, that comes back from Hobbes, the survival of the fittest in the state of nature. But with social Darwinism, it was like, then what is successful wins out and is a natural selection of the way things should be and the way things are, you know, are the best. So therefore, for example, uncontrolled profit motive that Adam Smith laissez-faire will produce the best results because it's based on the survival of the fittest and the weaker species and weaker people will die out. Talk about the gene pool, purifying the gene pool. Oh, you can see where this is going, I hope. We get to eugenics and the development of how do we manipulate and better gene pools for races, which I'll be talking about that next week as well, and the week thereafter in terms of World War II and the whole issue of uh, of eugenics, uh, which actually Indiana was a major place in the development of that, and they actually sent people, um, scientists, to Germany because uh, Hitler's people were in, very much interested in eugenics and the superior race. How do we create a superior race? That was a problem. Then we have the Kulturkampf, which was uh, primarily a German development in light of German unification. Talk about today the culture wars. Well, the culture wars have been going on all along, certainly since the mid 19th century. The Kulturkampf was again: how do we, how do we form national identity and unity? I talked in last lecture about the difference between the Prussians and the Bavarians. Bavarians predominantly Catholic, Prussians predominantly uh, Protestant. And how does that all play into itself, especially in light of the new developments all over? So there's this Kulturkampf was related to, you know, how do we do with the, deal with the new science, the new understanding of the world, the new world as such? And how does that play into with our religious perspectives? That was what was going on. Again, we'll come back to this later. Um, and I have up here the new science of anthropology, which is developing because in light of all these, it's like we need to study human beings. And then 
is, the question then becomes, is there one species of human beings or are there many, multiple? Uh, that's one argument. I mean, if all of a sudden it's like, okay, if human beings are biologically evolutionary developments, do we all come from the same source and origin or are there many different ones? In some ways, this is the same question that you know, we saw with the slave trade. If these people are fully human, then we have a problem, said the Dutch traders. Like, oh my gosh, uh, or some of them anyway. Because if they are fully human, like we are, they are children of God, just like we are. And we should not be treating other children of God like this. If they're animals, okay, because it's, you know, subdue the world, you know, be prosperous and multiply. That whole interpretation of Genesis, whereby human beings are to rule over lesser beings in all of creation rather than serve as the protectors of, but as the rulers of, for their own benefit. That was the idea that you know, allowed slavery to flourish, and it's still going on here in terms of, okay, if we are still looking at this from a scientific perspective of, of, of anthropology, how do we understand this? How do we understand different cultures and different peoples and how they all develop and where do they come from? Also, in terms of uh, indigenous peoples in territories that to us are completely foreign, like in Africa and in Asia, South America. How do we treat these creatures? So that's this new whole development. And then to up here, Freud and Einstein. Um, actually, we're going to be talking about Nietzsche later, but Nietzsche is very much a part of this too. But Freud and Einstein are questioning, again, the rationality of things. Freud, by pointing to the subconscious and the unconscious, that we are, you know, maybe we're not really acting based on our reason and will, but because of unconscious forces that we are unaware of. Again, undermining this concept of the, the, the rational individual. And with Einstein, it's like this rational universe of Newtonian physics where everything makes sense and it's all mechanical. All of a sudden, relativity throws that up in, the, up in, uh, in question mark. So is the universe the same that we thought it was? And if all these questions are going on, how do we deal with then the exploitation of other people? How do we deal with profit? How do we deal with our own desires and our own selfishness as people and as nations maybe the world is not as rational as we thought it was maybe what we thought was the way the world worked is not really the way the world worked so in some ways what the hell and that brings me then to world war one the war to end all wars um now, again, the, the textbook will go through the, the developments and battles and things. I just want to point out a couple of things here. I have the onset of a conflict. Uh, and one major aspect were these secret alliances and treaties, where we have nations allying with other nations. Um, we have you know, the Triple Entente and the Triple Alliance uh, forming. And so, but they, they were not made known and declared. They were secret. And so when you have these different alliances between Germany and Austria-Hungary and then uh, uh, Italy. The first Russia was kind of involved too. but then And then France and England and Russia, because Russia kind of switched sides. <laughs> and when one country is attacked, they all are supposed to come to a mutual defense. It'd be like little NATOs all over the place. If you know NATO and Article 5 in terms of if one of our member states is attacked, we all uh, uh, come to its defense. And that was a development after World War II. We'll talk more about that when we get there in the post-war period. But here's like little NATOs that was, was not were not made known. They were kept secret. So all of a sudden, war is declared. And part of this, too, is a lack of communication of what was going on. And what set it all up was the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria. Uh, and this gets into then in Serbia and Austria and socialistic ideas against the monarchy, against the conservative monarchy and aristocracy. Assassination. And that ended up to declaring war, and on we go. 
then it just expands and expands and expands based on some of these alliances. It pertains not only then to Europe, but to the world because of the new imperialism, because these European powers were global. So it had to be fought on a global scale. Now, too, what made this great war um, so horrible was a new warfare, which I've been talking about, because this is the first war where machine guns were used. Machine guns have been developed before. Machine guns after the rifle, I should have mentioned that in technological developments. The machine gun was developed before World War One to use in this quote unquote small wars in Africa. But now it was employed as, as, a, as an instrument of war and it was, you know, deadly. We also have the first tanks being employed in, in World War I. And that then also in terms of firepower and protection, that becomes a big problem. In some ways, a tank was like a, 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 a knight, a medieval knight. It was a warrior fighting group, just as the knight was too, with the squires and the horse and everything else. Now we have the tanks being the major forces of you know not just the infantry, but then the tanks. Uh, machine guns could be very effective against the infantry, but not so effective against the tanks. And then how do we really get to people if you want to just kill them? Let's gas them. We can use poison gas. And in World War I, the use of poison gas against the enemy on both sides was seen as an effective means of warfare. Because it's a way of killing people and if we can kill more of them than of us is it humane no it's horrible is you know forcing china to be open to the opium trade moral probably not but it makes us money because we are selling you know bringing back tea and we're making a lot of money in this trade doubly so because we get the opium we sell it to the chinese we get tea back we go and sell the tea we're just making all, all kinds of money and isn't this great who cares about the morality? In war, in a world war context, why should we be concerned about the morality of war, about the rules of war? Can't we use anything necessary to kill people? That's where the gas comes in. And then the trenches become so horrific because there was stalemate in Europe. And troops on both sides dug in. So French, English, German forces would come and they couldn't go back and forth. They would dig in in trenches. And then the territory between the trenches were no, was known as no man's land. And then you have to go over the trenches, try to attack the next trench. That's how it moved forward. And there were miles and miles and miles of tr trenches. And also they were originally kind of effective because if you don't have a trench, you just have an army advancing, you have then a trench there, they don't even necessarily see you and all of a sudden from nowhere, people come out of the trench and fight you and kill you. That led to this entrenchment. That's where the word comes from, entrenchment. It's bogging, settling down in trenches and the progress was very laborious, very costly, very horrible and the stories coming out of the trenches were sickening and shocking. I'm going to read you a rather long passage. I know I'm um, running out of time here, but uh, it's from um, Eric Maria Remarks, All Quiet on the Western Front, which was a book he wrote in 1928 um, about his time uh, as a German soldier. So bear with me. Um, if you've read it, fine. But if you've seen the movie, there's also there's been numerous movie, movies made of it, and a recent one, I think, in 2022. It really portrays the horror of what it was like. This is just a German soldier. I mean, Germans, they're the aggressors. They're the, you know, the unification, the second German Reich. That was what this was about, too. And that's why Germany, as we'll see, got the blame for it all. But there's still people. That's the whole point. Yeah. Uh, so bear with me. Uh, we'll get through this. I think it's important. 
Remark writes, We have become wild beasts. We do not fight. We defend ourselves against annihilation. It is not against men that we fling our bombs. What do we know of men in this moment when death is hunting us down? Now, for the first time in three days, we can see his face. Now, for the first time in three days, we can oppose him. We feel a mad anger. No longer do we lie helpless, waiting on the scaffold. We can destroy and kill to save ourselves, to save ourselves and to be revenged. We crouch behind every corner, behind every barrier of barbed wire, and hurl heaps of explosives at the feet of the advancing enemy before we run. The blast of hand grenades impinges powerfully on our arms and legs, crouching like cats we run on, overwhelmed by this wave that bears us along, that fills us with ferocity, turns us into thugs, into murderers, into God only knows what devils. This wave that multiplies our strength with fear and madness and greed of life, seeking the fighting for nothing but our deliverance. If your own father came over with him, you would not hesitate to fling a bomb at him. The forward trenches have been abandoned. Are they still trenches? They are blown to pieces, annihilated. They are only broken bits of trenches, holes linked by cracks, nests of craters. That is all. <clears throat> when the enemy's casualties increase, they do not count on so much resistance. It is nearly noon. The sun blazes hot. The sweat stings in our eyes. We wipe it off on our sleeves and often the blood with it. At last, we reach a trench that is in somewhat better condition. It is... Um, manned and ready for the counterattack, it receives us, our guns open in full blast, and it cut off the enemy attack. The lines behind us stop. They can advance no further. The attack is crushed by our, our, our artillery. We watch. The fire lifts a hundred yards, and we break forward. Beside me, a lance corporal has his head torn off. He runs a few steps more while the blood spouts from his neck like a fountain. It does not come uh, quiet to hand to hand. It does not come quite to hand-to-hand -hand fighting, they are driven back. We arrive once again at our shelter, shattered trench and pass it on beyond it. Oh, this turning back again. We reach the shelter of the reserves and yearn to creep in and disappear, but instead we must turn round and plunge again into the horror. If we were not automata at that moment, we would continue lying there, exhausted and without will, but we are swept forward again, powerless, madly savage and raging. We will kill for they are still our mortal enemies. Their rifles and bombs are aimed against us, and if we don't destroy them, they will destroy us. The brown earth, the torn, blasted earth, with a greasy shine under the sun's rays, the earth is the background of this re restless, gloomy world of automatons. Our gasping is the scratching of a quill, our lips are dry, our heads are debauched with stupor, thus we stagger forward. And into our pierced and shattered souls bores the torturing image of the brown earth, with the greasy sun and the convulsed and dead soldiers who lie there. It can't be helped, who cry and clutch at our legs as we spring away over them. We have lost all feeling for one another. We can hardly control ourselves when our glance lights on the form of some other man. We are insensible, dead men who through the same, some trick, some dreadful magic are still able to run into kill. A young Frenchman lags behind. He is overtaken. He puts up his hands and one, he still holds his revolver. Does he mean to shoot or to give himself a, a blow from a spade cleaves through his face? A second sees it and tries to run further, farther. A bayonet jabs into his back. He leaps in the air, his arms thrown wide, his mouth wide open, yelling. He staggers. In his back, the bayonet quivers. A third throws away his rifle, cowers down with his hands before his eyes. He is left behind with a few other prisoners to carry off the wounded. Suddenly, in the pursuit, we reach the enemy line. We are so close on the heels of our retreating enemies that we reach it almost at the same time as they. In this way, we suffer few casualties. A machine gun barks, but is silenced with a bomb. Nevertheless, the couple of seconds has sufficed to give us stomach wounds. With the butt of his rifle, Cat, one of his buddies, smashes to pulp the face of one of the unwounded gun machine gunners. We bayonet the others before they have time to get their bombs. Then thirstily we drink the water they have, have for cooling the guns. Everywhere wire cutters are snapping. Planks are thrown across the entanglements. We jump through the narrow entrances into the trenches. Hay strikes his spade into the neck of a gigantic Frenchman and throws the first hand grenade. We duck behind a breastwork for a few seconds. Then the straight bit of trench ahead of us is empty. The next throw whizzes a obliquely over the corner and a, clears a passage. As we run past, we toss handfuls down into the dugouts. The earth shudders. 
It crashes, smokes, and groans. We stumble over slippery lumps of flesh, over yielding bodies. I fall into an open belly on which lies a clean new officer's cap. Fight ceases. We lose touch with the enemy. We cannot stay here long, but must retire under cover of our artillery to our own position. No sooner do we know this than we dive into the nearest dugouts, and with the utmost haste seize on whatever provisions we can see, especially the tins of corned beef and butter, before we clear out. We get back pretty well. There is no further attack by the enemy. We lie for an hour panting and resting before anyone speaks. We are so completely played out that in spite of our great hunger, we do not think of the provisions. Then gradually, we become something like men again. I think that captures it. The barbed wire. Barbed wire would guard the trenches between no man's land. Remark tells in another case of going over the top. That's what it was called. Going over the top. Oh, if you say that's over the top. That comes from you're in the trench and you have to go attack the next trench. The enemy trench that you're facing. So you go over the top of the trench. Going over the top. If you get through the barbed wire. Now you have passages, but you have barbed wire on the other side. And barbed wire throughout no man's land because the further you can set up barbed wire, the more uh, obstacles the enemy has to get to you. He tells of one where a kid got stuck in the barbed wire and just fell away. And what was left were his hands. And Mark says, almost like in the shape of praying, stuck in the barbed wire. That level of horror. Dead bodies, rats, water in the trenches. It was horrible. And it was shocking, that lack of humanity. That's what he said. We were became wild beasts, automatons. And only back when things were quote-unquote safe in the trench, after the attack had been repulsed, can we even once again become anything like men, like human beings. That inhumanity, the dehumanization of war, was a shock for all of Europe, for all of the world. And in some ways was the major impact of this great war. Great war to counter aggression by aggressors. Germany was seen as the aggressor. But France and England, they were aggressors in Africa, in Asia. They stood up to the Germans. World War I ended in 1918 with the ceasefire and then the treaty, of, the peace treaty of, uh, signed in 1919 at Versailles. Gave guilt for the war, gave blame to the war for Germany and established reparations. Germany had to pay huge amounts of money. They had to completely demilitarize. They had to establish a republican government we're talking about Weimar Germany Wilhelmine Germany is getting rid of this empire this Reich putting an end to the second German Reich and damning Germany to, into poverty and insignificance completely taking away any type of power it had even to defend itself being caught between France and England and then the United States and then Russia, making sure it wasn't going to step out of line again. Woodrow Wilson issued his 14 points in terms of how to prevent this ever hap from happening again, establishing the League of Nations, the idea of we can no longer have these secret treaties, treaties and alliances. We have to make it, them all public so we really know what's going on. So if we know, if we attack, uh, if, if you know, well, Russia is attacking Ukraine, if Ukraine was part of NATO, Russia would have need to know that then all NATO is coming into it. If so, and Russia knows that. It knows that if it goes into uh, Poland, it's going to have real problems. Because then we'll be fighting NATO. But if that was not known, if that was all secret, 
Russia could just say, hey, yeah, of course we're going to go to Poland. That's next. Boom. And then, oh my God, look what happens. Because the whole point was this was such a shock to European, American, Western consciousnesses, understandings of who are we then? Who are we? And what is all this about? This has to stop. This was the war to end all wars. And we're going to be sure to do that and take the necessary steps. And first thing we have to do is make sure that Germany pays for it and Germany is demilitarized and Germany is no longer a Reich, no longer a Kaiser leading a Reich, a pretense. No, it doesn't matter that the British Empire is still the British Empire. It doesn't have a monarch. It doesn't mean that the France is not a republic. It still has its colonies and its influences. Everyone suffered greatly. It's called the Lost Generation. The number of young males who were killed in World War One, far beyond anything in any war ever before. The peace treaty to establish a peace. Not that it was perfect. Not that it really did what it was intended to do. Not that the League of Nations did what it intended to do or Wilson's 14 points. And it was known at the time and feared at the time. Uh, Ferdinand Foch, the French general and the Supreme Allied Commander uh, during the Great War, was attributed uh, to saying, and it's still debated whether he actually said this at the time or whether this is an apocryphal attribution and much later. Uh, and I'm not going to go into that debate because this quotation makes its point whether it was authentic or not. But he said, supposedly he said, and some people think it was authentic in terms of responding to the Treaty of Versailles. This is not a peace treaty. It is an armistice for 20 years. The war to end all wars. Right. The armistice, so to speak, didn't last 20 years. We'll see that next week and the week after. When the Great War became simply World War I because World War broke out again. Thanks so much. Oh, sorry. Okay, thank you. Sorry.